I'm going to tell you a story that I've not been allowed to tell on YouTube before. This story is about the biggest commitment that I've ever made in my life. Over the course of this story, you'll hear great successes, national medals, college recruiting, Ivy League championships, but you'll also hear great setbacks, a lot of disappointments, a lot of regrets. This is not a happy story, nor is it a sad story. More than anything, it's a story about struggle and the lessons that I learned through persistence. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Every story has a beginning, and this story begins in elementary school. In 2009, I was placed into a gifted class, which meant for the first time in my life, I was surrounded by peers who were all exceptional at something, or so it felt, and I didn't have anything. So I chose something, and what I chose was running. I'd always been good at running as a kid, but now I wanted to be really good. So I started to train and compete. I would run local 5K road races with a goal of breaking 20 minutes. When I got to middle school track, it seemed that I was a little bit better suited for the middle distances. There was no 5K, so I went down in distance and I ended up thriving at the 400. I ran at 57 in the 400, which was good enough for third in my county. And when I got to high school, I just doubled down on that. I kept training for the 400. And if you're a track head, you'll laugh at the progression here. Within three weeks, I went 57, 55, 52. And then I ran another 52 the next week to take third at provincial championships or OFSA. It was so fun to me and I wanted to take things to the next level. And I talked to a local track club coach and he suggested that I move up a distance, that I really focus on the true mid distance, the 800 and the 1500. And I did just that. So the next year I broke two for the first time in the 800. And then the year after that, I had a real breakthrough. I uh, finished second at nationals in both the 800 and the 1500. I ran a 152 in the 800. And at the same time, the girl that I was dating at the time, one of the top runners in Canada, uh, was studying for her SAT. She wanted to go D1, and I had no reason to believe going into that season that I would be fast enough to go D1. I was, I was pretty good, but not that good. It just wasn't on my radar, but since she was studying for it, I decided I'd hop in too, and I took the SAT one time. I got a 1540 out of 1600, uh, which was good enough for top 1%, and I really started to, to see some interest from coaches after that. And in particular, I was a really appealing candidate for Ivy League coaches. And in fact, the, the first college coach that I ever approached was the Harvard coach and I, I visited a few other Ivy League schools was recruited by a few other ones but I really just fell in love with Harvard and I committed there really early and that was that now the end of my high school track experience was pretty rough I actually took a step forward in my season opener I ran a 354 for the 15 I, I medaled at OFSA again in the 15 silver this time but um yeah I got in a car crash shortly thereafter and, and I missed the rest of my season uh, I couldn't train, I couldn't compete, and yeah, that was really tough. You know, I got back on the horse pretty quickly. I wasn't too seriously hurt, and uh, yeah, just got, got right back into things and, and training for college track. College track is just a completely different animal to high school track. In high school, I would spend maybe one, two hours a day training max. In college, our practices would regularly run three, four hours a day, five, six days a week and we're talking on top of school, on top of classes, homework, etc. It was, you know, my first time away from home. I was 17 years old. I was trying to be the top of my class and kill it in running, and it was a lot of pressure that I thought that I could handle, and I didn't really have a, a support system with boots on the ground. You know, my family, my friends were all back in Canada, and um, yeah, the people that were there at Harvard, didn't really tell me to, to slow down and ease off until it was a little too late. So, you know, indoor season that year actually went pretty well. Um, I was running quite fast and we ended up winning the Ivy League championship in the four by eight. Um, but after that season, my entire training group, all the mid D runners just kind of started to fall apart. None of us were adapting well to the training and the stress and running became actually like a pretty miserable thing for me. It got to the point where my mental health started to be really negatively affected and I made the decision to walk away from college track because at the same time, my YouTube channel was blowing up completely independent of running. Because of the NIL rules at the time, I couldn't make money off of my name, image, and likeness as a student athlete, so I wasn't allowed to talk about running at all. So here I had this kind of blossoming career on YouTube, this really exciting, rewarding thing, and... 
I had this huge kind of obstruction to that, which was running. I couldn't marry the two. But I I got this call that summer after first year from the distance coach. And I'd been training with the mid D group up to this time. And the distance coach said, hey, I know you're not happy. Why don't you move up to my group for a year? If you don't progress, you can walk away. No hard feelings. But I really want you to enjoy the sport. And I agreed. I said, that sounds like like a good idea. I also want to enjoy the sport. This has been a longtime passion of mine. So I did that. So sophomore year. I dove right into the distance group and uh, yeah, had a bunch of struggles right away. I mean, adapting to distance training as a mid D runner is really hard. Um, On top of that, my girlfriend and I at the time had broken up and this is my first serious relationship ending and it was not, I was not in a good place. YouTube continued to add this stress and so on, but I, but I actually ended up doing pretty well at the end of that year. I ran a a 350 for 1500 meters. And I was kind of, you know, feeling pretty good about myself. I thought, okay, I got through all this adversity. I decided I was going to take a year off from school. I was just going to go to Montreal, figure out this YouTube thing without the pressure of Harvard, train, get really fit and come back and enjoy the rest of my college year. And for the first six months or so of that year, I actually did that quite successfully. You know, I was training really well. I I won a race. Uh, I got a little injured in the winter, but that's no big deal. He's the fittest I've ever been in my life, to be honest. And then... COVID hit. I had already been training alone for a number of months at this time, so I thought COVID was going to be no big deal. But I was wrong. You know, I'm up in Canada. The borders were shut down for quite some time. I couldn't get to America to be with my team and train and race. I just felt really isolated, and, and the training that I was doing felt a little bit pointless. Training so hard with no opportunity for competition. I had a really hard time with that mentally. It felt like every time I thought, you know, I was going to get to go back, uh, it just got pushed back further and further. And it, it got to the point where I realized that I had spent two full calendar years without competing. And you know, in retrospect, I could have definitely made some different decisions. I I could have found a way around some of those restrictions. I could have found a better group in Canada to train with. Um, But I just didn't know with all the uncertainty. It just kind of sucked. And there was a positive that came out of it, though. And the, the positive was that I really kind of reinvented my relationship with running because I started to realize that this is a really valuable thing in my life, regardless of whether I'm competing or not. Because running is this thing that it it lets you push yourself as hard as you possibly can, like until you start to shut down. And you get to see what breaks, and then you get to try to fix it, and then you get to do it all again. It's this thing that lets you become anti-fragile. You become better as a result of breaking down not worse as long as you keep getting up as long as you keep progressing and 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 remaining diligent then you keep moving forward and you keep learning about yourself and and it's this really valuable life lesson i think of perseverance and of diligence and of patience with yourself and it was really over covid that i discovered that but eventually uh things got a lot better in terms of the numbers with covid vaccines started to get deployed and we were able to go back to school. I was able to go back for my senior year after two calendar years away from from competing. When we got to indoor track, it got really fun again because I got to to run some of the best times that I've ever run. Um, I got to score points for the team at, at Indoor Heps in New York, which was really, really cool. And it was this really rewarding payoff for those years away from competition. And then it felt like that momentum was gonna get carried through to the outdoor season. I, I opened that outdoor season, my fastest opener yet in a 1500 or ever in a 1500 or in a 351. Unfortunately, uh, that was the fastest that I would run all season. I was going through a breakup, which luckily, you know, I had grown a lot since the previous relationship and I, I was doing much better, but it's still not a fun thing. And at the same time, I'm, I'm ending school. I'm trying to figure out what I'm doing after school and and who I am outside of the context of Harvard, having formed my identity there over the past five years. And that was that was really tricky for me. And so I wasn't sleeping very well. I wasn't recovering very well. And, and running became this thing that I felt like I was just enduring rather than being something that was fun, rather than being something that I looked forward to. It was something that I was just showing up to because I needed to finish the commitment that I started. So it's a little bit of a sunk cost fallacy. And I, I knew it at the time. But more than that, it's also just kind of respecting it has played such a pivotal role in my life and I I wasn't going to walk away from it early. But eventually I did make that decision to walk away. I had the opportunity to continue racing, especially over the summer when I I was coming home. And it just didn't excite me. And I just thought, you know what, there's going to come a point where 
I have to decide that I'm done with running. And I think that point has come. It just felt like the natural transition point for me. And it freed up a lot of bandwidth for me to deal with these other things. But yeah, I was, I was still pretty bitter about it at first. I'm not going to lie. Like, I felt like I had put so much into this and I was disappointed in myself because although I had made this massive time and energy commitment, I had failed to, to really focus on it. You know, I had so many other things going on in my life that I chose to do knowing that they would negatively influence my running career. You know, YouTube definitely has negatively influenced my running career. It's taken a lot of, of energy and, uh, and commitment that could have been poured into running you know, and, and school as well, and, and a bunch of the things that I do. But I, but I quickly realized that I was judging myself on a very narrow set of outcomes that don't really align with what I value. The, the truth is that holistically speaking, I'm incredibly proud of myself uh, and the, the progression that I've made as a person throughout college. I mean, I look at the 17 year old kid that, that entered Harvard and I look at myself now as I leave it and I'm just a lot happier. In many ways, the, the competitive instincts that I had in high school were a result of insecurity. I mean, even before that, like I said, I started running because I wanted to have a thing like that I was really good at, like something that, that could be mine, you know? With all these other kids picking other things, this would be my thing. And it, it is an insecurity thing, a little bit. And I loved it, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that I, that I didn't love running. I really did love it. But, but to be so single-mindedly competitive about running is just not something that aligns with who I am, who I've become as a person. But what's interesting is that those values have been developed and nurtured in large part thanks to running. Would I do it again? You know, if I was entering college as the person I am now, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be a very good college runner um, and I, I wouldn't do it. But looking at the person who I was when I entered college, I would absolutely do it again because I needed to be that person and I needed to go through what I went through in order to become who I am now. So I can't regret any of it, even though looking back, I wasn't a very good college runner at all, especially compared to how good I was in high school. But I'm so much prouder of the person I am today and I'm so much happier. And I think that's worth it. So thanks for listening to my D1 story. Uh, as roundabout as it may have been, hopefully you, you got something out of it. Hopefully it made you think a little bit. And if you have any questions about running, you know, in the Ivy League, in college, whatever, I'd love to hear them, maybe make a video about it in the future. This has been a big part of my life that I just haven't talked about whatsoever on this channel. So thanks for watching. I'm John Fish. I'll see you next time.